Hello, it is I, Dr. Brian Lorgan 111, and welcome to my Void Stranger story recap. And a quick but necessary spoiler alert, if you somehow arrived at this video and have not yet played Void Stranger but hope to do so in the future, now is a good time to stop the video as there are going to be a lot of spoilers. You have been warned. Void Stranger is, on its surface, a 2D grid-based traversal puzzle game but that gameplay is embedded in a rich world, which the player learns about mostly through a series of cutscene flashbacks that occur at the end of various puzzle segments. The beautiful pixel art and terrific music make the story bits very entertaining to watch, but the fragmented way that the bits of the story are doled out to the player over time mean that casual players are unlikely to appreciate the depth of the story being told. Indeed, they might not be able to follow the story at all. I have played about 50 hours of the game thus far. While I'm clearly not yet at the end of the game, I have so far witnessed two main parts, which I'll refer to as Act 1 and Act 2, which center on the characters Grey and Lily, respectively. At the end of Act 2, I decided I probably had enough information to combine the two intertwined stories of these two acts into chronological order so that I could finally puzzle out exactly what was happening in the story. And what I found was amazing. I spent about 20 hours on the process of reviewing my old videos, taking notes and screenshots, transcribing conversations, and assembling the timeline into chronological order. The thing that motivated me to spend 20 hours on this process was that during every few minutes of the process, I found something new. Sometimes I'd find just a correction or clarification to my understanding of the story, and spoiler alert to those who have watched the previous 53 videos, I got a lot of stuff wrong. <laughs> Sometimes I'd see something important that was plainly on the screen, but I just missed it during my playthrough. Assembling the timeline and transcribing conversations, I clarified the plotline and got a deeper understanding of the characters and their motivations and emotions. And through screenshots, I discovered that there seemed to be important hints suggesting deeper mysteries, or explanations for mysteries, that sometimes appear on screen for only a few frames during a cutscene animation. Thus, at this point of the game, I feel like I've uncovered a hidden layer of meaning and mystery in the game, and I had to do my best to tease it apart and understand it all. This process might be reminiscent of another popular video game of the last few years, which I won't even mention by name for spoiler reasons. Anyway, that was a long prelude to my Void Stranger story recap, so let's get started. Prelude Before the game even begins, we witness a dark star crashing into the earth. Then we witness a woman walk up to a square hole in the ground, and then jump in. This scene with Grey is actually already out of chronological order, but it serves as a good hook at the start of the game to suggest that there are going to be cutscenes and a story of a wider world, so I've included it here in the prelude. The rest, however, will be presented in chronological order, to the best of my understanding. Act 1. Grey in the first cutscene during the gameplay, we meet Lily, a princess, daughter of the king, and her lady-in-waiting, Grey, who serves as her mother figure in a kingdom where we'll eventually learn that Lily's mother, the queen, died long ago. We quickly gain a sense of the relationship between the rambunctious, spoiled brat Princess Lily and her patient but firm lady-in-waiting, Grey. Lily, who has been beating up the castle guards, is hiding under her bedsheets and attacks Grey as a ferocious demon princess monster in a ridiculous interactive RPG-like fight scene, which first demonstrates the entertaining methods the game developers will use tiny samples of other game genres in order to help whimsically tell the story of Void Stranger. After the fight, the characters return to normal and have a more mundane conversation about such topics as how the princess smells to high heaven due to her refusal to take a bath. The player is left wondering if the princess is actually a powerful demon, she did allegedly beat up the royal guards, or were they just playing along, or whether this is an imaginative presentation by the game developers for our entertainment. In the next cutscene, we overhear the king talking to Grey, and learn some backstory. We learn that his kingdom is dwindling, and he's trying to marry off Lily, presumably to another prince or king in order to combine kingdoms, but Lily keeps physically attacking her suitors. 
Grey tries to calm the king down, but he angrily orders her to go and talk some sense into Lily. Next, we see Lily sitting at her mother's grave. Grey arrives and walks up, and the two of them have a conversation where Lily airs her frustrations, but we also get a sense of the mutual respect and understanding that these two have with one another. In the next cutscene, Grey and a reluctant Lily are traveling by carriage to meet a new suitor in the Kingdom to the North. They are ambushed by bandits, and we discover that Grey, too, is a powerful fighter who can handle the bandits. But when Lily exits the carriage to watch what's going on, another group of bandits grab her. But then, Johan appears and deals with the remaining bandits easily. Powerful, complimentary, and suave, he introduces himself to the breathless Princess Lily, and a suitable match has finally been made. That night, we hear Lily excitedly talking about how great Johan is before Lily goes to bed. Later, Grey is visited by Johan, and he knows about the reputation of the powerful Grey the Destroyer, and lightly accuses her of just toying with the bandits for fun. Johan is scheduled to meet Lily more formally the next day as part of the official courtship. The next cutscene seems to occur perhaps some days or weeks later. We learn that Lily and Johan have been exchanging letters, as we see Lily trying on dresses to look her best, and suddenly now concerned about whether she smells. Grey expresses mild concern about how quickly Lily has fallen in love, but then... A messenger barges in to say that Johan has arrived unannounced, and Lily goes rushing out to see him. Downstairs, after a short time, Grey walks in to meet the couple, and Lily declares that they have an important announcement to make. It seems like a wedding may be on the horizon. In the next cutscene, Lily finally has found an interest in learning to dance, and Grey is teaching her. Once again, the game developers utilize other game genres to make a minigame, to make part of the cutscene be interactive gameplay, this time a rhythm game. Princess Lily asks Grey where she learned to dance, and we learn that Lily's mother taught Grey, and that Lily doesn't remember a thing about her mother, implying that the queen died long ago. Also, eagle-eyed viewers who have already seen the first two acts may have spotted a Void Lord Sif in each of the last two cutscenes, but that's something we can return to later. In the next cutscene, it's the night before the wedding. Lily is nervously trying on her wedding dress, which is beautiful and white, with a pattern of flowers and stars embroidered on it. This is the scene where Grey gives the pendant to Lily, an important wedding gift. Then we cut to the grave of the queen later that night, where Grey has summoned Johan for a secret meeting. The conversation is cryptic, but based on what happened before and after this, I think the implication is this. Grey was anxious to fulfill the king's order and help marry off Lily. Johan was the first and only candidate that Lily had any interest in, so Grey was especially motivated to ensure that things worked out between them. Meanwhile, for Johan, he had made a contract with the Void Lords to obtain his powers. That contract, we can infer, required human sacrifices of his subjects, souls to feed hungry ones like Lord B. He began sacrificing the criminals of his kingdom, but he still needed more sacrifices, and so he comes up with a plan to sacrifice a nearby dwindling kingdom by marrying its princess and becoming its ruler. And so when Lillian Grey visit his kingdom, he has found both the means to his plan, marrying Lily, as well as an unexpected side benefit, a beautiful, powerful lady-in-waiting who will do anything to ensure that this union works out. So Johan, in private with Grey, pretends he's not interested in the naive, spoiled brat, and uses that feigned reluctance as leverage to force, coerce, Grey into a side affair. This meeting that we're witnessing now is Grey calling a halt to the affair. That, however, does not sit well with Johan, who, with a snap of his fingers, uses his lightning magic to smite Grey in an instant. In the next cutscene, it's the next morning and Grey awakens. Johan had failed to kill her, and the grave of the queen is destroyed. I think the non-deus ex machina explanation is that Johan's lightning spell 
got lightning rotted by the metal sword in the grave right behind Gray, taking most of the blow. Alternatively, one might imagine that just as Gray pledged to the queen before the queen's death to protect Lily, now the queen, after death, has had an act to protect a Gray. Either way, after getting her bearings, Gray has only one thought. Lily, she runs back to the castle. There we see a scene almost identical to the very first cutscene. The princess is out of control! Gray sees Lily's bedroom empty, and then finds Lily on the edge of the balcony, looking almost possessed. Later, Lily described herself as so scared that she wanted to die, but we can only speculate about what transpired to change her demeanor that past night. I imagine that Johan revealed his true evil side to her and threatened her. In any case, Gray gets Lily off the balcony and brings her back inside, and a solar eclipse begins at that moment, making things even more ominous. Johan and his soldiers then bust into the princess's bedroom, and Johan accuses his Grey the Destroyer of assaulting the princess on her wedding day. His men will take Grey to prison, where tomorrow she'll be executed for treason. Lily finally speaks up, telling Johan she'll do what he wants, so long as he doesn't hurt Grey. Johan says he will honor the princess's wish if Grey comes peacefully, and Grey agrees. And to me, this seems like Grey at her lowest point. She messed up, and now she briefly gives up. The final flashback cutscene of Act 1 is long and filled with story detail. First, let's just reiterate the essential plot points. Four Eyes rescues Grey from the castle dungeon. Grey arrives too late. The wedding and coronation have taken place, and Johan has just used his lightning magic to kill everyone else except his bride. Johan does the trope of bad guy monologuing just before completing his evil plan to explain to Grey his own backstory. He made a contract with the Void Lords to obtain powers in exchange for sacrificing souls, and he planned to sacrifice souls from Lily's kingdom all along. Mwahahaha. The Void Lords, B and Sif, appear and say Johan needs just one more soul to fulfill his contract, and Johan chooses Grey as his final kill. But Lily stops it by asking the Void Lords to make her own contract. Take me, but keep Grey safe. Judge Zero appears and says Dis approves the terms of Lily's contract. Grey argues, and the Void Lords say that if she wants Lily back, meet them at the end of the Void. Lily gives the pendant back to Grey and then disappears with the Void Lords. Johan and Grey stand alone in the room, and Johan tries again to kill Grey. But his powers are gone. He didn't complete the contract in time, and his contract was voided. Grey punches Johan as hard as you would imagine she would. Got all that? Good. Now let's dig into three subtler details. 1. Four Eyes did not rescue Grey. Four Eyes is an incompetent court lackey and incapable of the brilliant rescue and diversion plan that we witness. This is Void Lord Sif, in disguise, steering the outcome. Sif also told two guards to exit the ceremony and defend Grey. Had Sif not done so, then Johan's lightning storm would have killed enough souls to fulfill the contract. The reason I am certain that this is Sif's meddling will be explained near the end of this video. 2. The chapel's stained glass depicts a flower and shining stars. Remember that for later. 3. Just before Lily and the Void Lords disappear, she says, there's something I need to tell you. We'll revisit that toward the end of Act 2. That ends the flashbacks from Act 1. Now for what happens in the real time from the actual gameplay. Presumably some time passes. How would Grey know or discover how to enter the Void Tower? I don't know. In any case, the next thing that happens on screen chronologically is the opening cutscene of the game. The next noteworthy scene is Grey obtaining the Void Rod, also known as Ad Scepter. I believe that's a statue of Void Lord Ad behind the chest. The rod gives the power to move the floor, but also confines the player to the grid. We meet a number of NPCs during our journey through the basements. Most of them are relatively inconsequential to the game, but notable to its symbolic structure, so I'll wait until near the end of the video to discuss most of the NPCs in bulk. The first notable encounter is on Basement 30, where we meet Tail. Unlike Lily in Act 2, 
Grey notably does not have her own character portrait when talking to NPCs. We just get text boxes like, you tell her you're looking for a young woman. Tails says a lot, including the fact that the remaining Void Lords know about the secret exits on some levels. The tail encounter is mentioned here, as that's where it occurs chronologically, but I'm going to save more discussion of what Tails says until the end of the video. On Basement 44, there was a Void Lord, but at the time I didn't know what Void Lords looked like, who offered me to trade a hint about the secret exits for my locust idols. But I chose to see if I could kill this NPC by pushing a rock onto him instead, and I succeeded. I wonder what he would have said. All the way down on Basement 167, we are forced to interact with a reflection monster to move forward. Grey sees herself, as we've seen her in flashback cutscenes, wearing a low-cut dress rather than the cape that she's wearing in the opening cutscene and that her player sprite wears. We'll revisit this again in Act 2. Basement 255 is the end of the road, where I do some fun experiments with game mechanics that we can discuss more toward the end of the video, but eventually I make a hole and fall down, and that is where we encounter the Void Lords, which has been Grey's goal all along. We'll discuss the opening lines of the Void Court later in the video. Grey has demonstrated devotion by making it to the end of the Void, and thus Dis is willing to make a contract. Grey says she wants Lily back. The contract offered, Grey can take one soul back with her, on the condition that she never returns. Grey agrees to the terms. Then Judge Zero reveals, in a monkey's paw-esque twist, that Lily is pregnant, and Grey has to choose whether to take Lily or the baby. The screen goes black, the credits roll, ending with, the adventure of life goes on, we see a flower being handed from one hand to another, and poof, Grey is back in the world, but now the modern world. Her previous memories were of castles and horse-drawn carriages, but now we're in a city with traffic lights and tall office buildings, and I don't know the reason for how or why so much time has passed, but Grey is now standing in a city with a baby in her hands. The game closes itself. At the time, I interpreted this scene as Grey's imagination, mourning what she gave up, and I had imagined that Grey had chosen to save Lily and not the baby. But now I know Grey chose the baby, and I have a theory about why she made that choice, which I will share later. In any case, the story continues in modern times, and I'll continue telling it chronologically. Act 2. Lily First, a quick note about terminology. Princess Lily, L-I-L-Y, has a child, Lily, L-I-L-L-I-E, and since they sound the same when spoken, I shall endeavor to use Princess Lily to refer to the mother, and Modern Lily to refer to the child when the context makes it ambiguous. The focus of Act 2 is on Modern Lily and Grey. Just as in Act 1, the story of modern Lily on Earth will be told through a series of flashback cutscenes that we experience at each of the resting points Lily visits as she progresses down through the Void Tower basements. But Act 2 has a new wrinkle. Chronologically, the very first scenes from this act come from the end of the recent gameplay. In the previous video, I solved some jigsaw puzzles to view scenes from modern Lily's earliest past, which were accompanied by the conversation that happens near the end of the game thus far. And for viewers of the series thus far, in my prior video, I failed to solve two of the jigsaw puzzles, and as a result, I missed some essential pieces of the story and explanation. Fortunately, I'd saved a backup copy of my game save files, and since the prior episode, I've replayed that section on my own to discover what I've missed, and I'm glad that I did that. So now let's hear that conversation in its entirety, for context about the conversation that follows. Grey had raised the baby that we know as modern Lily, as though she were her own child. Lily does not learn that Grey is not her real mother until she's an adult. She confirms her suspicions about her birth in this conversation with Freya, a close friend of Grey's. Each portion of the conversation has an accompanying screenshot from solving the jigsaw puzzles. 
I shall read each conversation section in its entirety. Freya, how did you and Gray meet? Why are you asking something like that out of nowhere? You know why. Did you... Did you ever meet my father? Lily, I... I'm not a child anymore. Please, tell me. I guess you deserve an explanation. It was years ago, but I still remember it vividly. At the time, I was hardly having any sleep. So I got out of bed early to catch a glimpse of a solar eclipse. When it was over, I saw a strange woman covered in tattered clothes in the middle of the street. She was just lying there, quietly, gently holding something between her hands, almost as if she'd appeared out of nowhere. That woman was gray? Yeah. When I got closer, her eyes met. I'd never seen eyes as dark as hers. She was on the verge of tears. When she finally started speaking, I couldn't understand her at all, but it was evident how scared she was. Then I saw what, who, she was cradling. A baby ever so small and frail, almost like a doll. I thought I was dreaming, but there you were, Lily. And then what? Well, I couldn't just leave you two there, so I took you in. After the dust settled, we took you to a checkup. You'd already grown into a perfectly healthy baby. Gray, however, it was hard to tell at a glance, but her body was covered in old bruises and scars. The doctor also noticed something abnormal. Her womb and ovaries were both missing, as if they'd been completely removed. Yet there were no signs of surgery of any kind, despite all the other damage her internal organs had sustained. She couldn't have ever given birth, that much was certain. I guess that settles it then. You hardly sound surprised. I had my doubts, for longer than I care to admit. What about my real parents? Didn't Gray tell you about them? Not much. When I asked her about your father, who's Johan by the way, she told me he died a long time ago. And your mother? Who is Princess Lily? Gray never said anything about her. But when I tried to bring it up, Gray wouldn't admit to it, but I could see it open some old wounds much deeper than those on her skin. Am I supposed to feel sorry for her now? Lily, I can't pretend to understand what you're going through, but I do know that Gray always took care of you like one of her own. She loved you more than anything. And then the game cuts away. Those screenshots and the conversation describe the events of Gray's arrival that happened next in chronological presentation at the very first events of Act 2. But this conversation itself won't take place until many years in the future, which we'll get to again later in this video. Chronologically, the next things that happen are seen in the flashbacks that modern Lily has at the resting points while she's diving the basements of the Void Tower. Note that all the flashback memories are told from a third-person omniscient point of view and seem to focus on Grey, even though modern Lily is the one diving the Void Tower in Act 2. The first flashback cutscene from Act 2 shows Grey nursing baby Lily. You've grown so fast. What a relief. This world may have changed, but you'll need to become strong for your mother's sake. She's still waiting. I can't let her down again. We'll revisit those last lines of Grey later in the video. In the next cutscene, it's a few years later, and we see Grey touring a rundown old house. She then has a phone conversation with Freya, saying how bad the house is, and that she plans to take it. Lily appears to be excited to be moving into a house where she can have her own big room. I don't know why the Four Eyes sprite is reused here for the person showing the house, as this is neither Four Eyes from the castle days, nor do I think it's Sif in disguise, and Grey doesn't express any recognition for the character, so I guess it's just the game developers reusing an asset of a fun and silly animated sprite? It still seems like a curious choice to me. In any case, at this point when I was playing the game, I was focused on the basement puzzles and got completely lost in the story. So apologies for my viewers for all the mistaken assumptions and speculations that I've made over the past 15 episodes or so. In the next cutscene, Grey is reading a bedtime story to Lily. I'll read it in its entirety. 
In the beginning, when sky and earth were still one and the same, a flower bloomed, lighting up the space with stars. Beings who basked in their light were granted both thought and emotion. Among those beings were humans. And to interject a quick aside, you may recall the stained glass in Princess Lily's wedding chapel has a very similar motif to this picture. Filled with gratitude, people began to pray to the stars, but the stars didn't answer them. Maybe they can't hear us from this far, people thought. With their combined efforts, the worshippers built a great tower. Atop of it, humans were able to grow wings and fly as far as the eye can see. These winged messengers took flight, hoping one day to reach the stars they so admired. Time passed, until one day, something unexpected happened. A star has fallen down. People rejoiced with excitement as they gathered around it from far and wide. Had the stars finally heard their prayers? This must be an answer. But the fallen star didn't shine like the others. Its light was a completely black and cold void. From that light arose beings of unspeakable horror. Beings that preyed upon the weak-minded, offering them power and eternal life. For them, humans were nothing but playthings, a fertile ground to sow their seeds of disorder and deceit. When people saw the true nature of these demons, they sealed the fallen star within the tower and buried it so deep no one would ever see its light again. But it was all too late, for demons had already found their way into man's heart. And so, just like the people had once learned to admire the stars, they also learned to fear them. And to inject another quick aside, you may recall that when the center of the stained glass of Princess Lily's wedding chapel exploded out, it revealed the eclipse ending with a similar image to the center of the one here. So that's the entirety of the bedtime story. A young modern Lily asks for a different bedtime story for once, but Gray says, Most have already forgotten this story completely. It's very important that you remember it. Later in the story, we learn that Gray works in a linguistics department that studies extinct languages and preserves and translates old manuscripts. I imagine that's what we're looking at here, perhaps? In any case, we, the audience, know that Gray has lived the experience of the Tower and met demons, the Void Lords, in the story. In the next cutscene, Freya and her daughter Sonya come to see Gray and Lily on Halloween. Freya, you may recall, was very pregnant in the jigsaw puzzle scene where she first meets Grey, so we can infer that Sonya and Lily are nearly identical in age. Their costumes, however, paint them as diametrically opposed. Lily is beaming in her bright white handmade dress with a star pendant, whereas Sonya looks grumpy in her store-bought black demon costume as the storytellers reinforce recurring motifs of the game through the artwork of this scene. The young girls are dropped off for their candy party events, and Freya and Grey sit down to have coffee and chat. There are three noteworthy bits of the story we learn from their conversation. First, that Lily has been getting into fights at school. It seems she shares a trait with her real mother. Second, that Grey has not told Lily that Grey is not her birth mother. Third, Freya wants Grey to live a little and sets her up on a blind date, and Grey reluctantly agrees. Freya is perhaps the most generous and kind character we've witnessed in the story. She took Grey and Lily into her own home for years in their time of need, and clearly continues to do her best to help them out in the years that follow. She also contrasts with Grey in style, as Freya is warm, open, and easygoing, whereas Grey's behavior is more closed off and rigid. The next cutscene features another, other game genre minigame, as Grey is out on her blind date. Apart from the backstory about Grey's job preserving and translating old manuscripts, there really isn't much that contributes to the story that we learn here, though I do wonder what other dialogue I would have seen if I had chosen other conversation options. The most noteworthy bit is how the scene ends. The line, I swore to take care of her. From the perspective of the person playing the game for the first time, sure sounds like the implied debt that Grey had to the Queen to take care of Princess Lily back in Act 1. But in this scene now, Grey is speaking about modern Lily. 
We'll revisit this promise later, but for now, speaking these words seems to suddenly be a jolting reminder to Grey about the events of Act One. Grey is still a woman on a mission, trying to make good on old promises, and her singular devotion to that cause means that, in her mind, any time spent on frivolous indulgences, such as trying to have fun on a date night, are incompatible with her goals. Freya was trying to loosen Grey up a bit by suggesting the date, but after this event, Grey seems to become even more rigid and demanding. In the next cutscene, Lily has been fighting at school again, and we witness the fallout conversation during the car ride home between the grumpy teen and the quiet but firm Grey. The most noteworthy nugget is the explicit revelation that Grey has been training Lily to fight, though only to defend herself. The rest of the scene is rather mundane, but it still oozes with the charm of the artful storytelling that we've seen throughout the game. The next flashback cutscene takes place a few years later, and has two major parts. In the first part, modern Lily, a girl perhaps about 17 years old, pretends to be a monster hiding in the bedsheets in a scene that calls back to her mother's behavior back in Act 1. Grey is not party to her childish games, however chiding that Lily is too old for games like this. The fact that Lily is so old and still trying to play such games perhaps speaks to a stolen childhood, and so it's useful to contrast Lady in Waiting's Grey's treatment of Princess Lily in Act 1 with the current scenes with Grey and modern Lily. There is a different power dynamic in Act 1. Lily was a princess, and thus had free reign to act however she chose, and Grey just tried to influence Princess Lily within the confines of her role as Lady-in-Waiting. But since Grey lacked the power to enforce discipline, Princess Lily was, and I'm quoting Grey from Act 1, an insufferable, childish little imp. In Act 2, while Grey shows the same patience and kindness as she did in Act 1, the pendulum of discipline has obviously swung in the opposite direction in Act 2. Lily is expected to take placement exams to secure her place in college before enlisting in military service. The mention of military service was a little surprising to me, but then I recalled that the developers of the game are from Finland, and Finland is a country with mandatory military service for able men over the age of 18. Women can also volunteer, but it seems rare that they do. So I think this scene helps emphasize how firmly Grey is driving Lily towards Grey's standards of excellence. Furthermore, I had already witnessed, back in episode 23 of my playthrough, this photo, which clearly shows a picture of modern Lily, with long hair tied back in a tight bun, wearing a military uniform with a Finnish flag on the arm. Since these memories photos appear as part of the game menu options, I don't think that that means that there's time travel and that Grey diving the tower back in Act 1 actually witnessed this photo. Rather, it seems like these memories are just a bonus challenge of the tower gameplay for the game player to witness those photos as bonus content for solving puzzles. But that bonus content has definitely helped me firm up my understanding of the sequence of events and the timeline. But this same cutscene also has a second part. This part is hard to understand, so here's a wild speculation about what transpired. So I wasn't imagining things is Lily's thought. As a teenager, a moment after a conversation about entrance exams with Grey, Grey leaves the room and Void Lord B appears before Lily's eyes and threatens her. The fact that B speaks of dreams seems to imply time travel, as though when someone in the Void Tower rests at a birch tree and has a memory of the past, the Void Lords can enter that memory and manifest themselves in those past events. Is that how the Void Lords interact with the earthly world? Rings a faint bell with the end of the bedtime story we heard earlier, perhaps? But I'm speculating wildly, and I really just don't grok this bit. Also, the words, you weren't invited, I think carry a significance that I still can't fully appreciate. I think this is literally the first moment of any flashback cutscene thus far, from Act 1 or Act 2, where Grey is not present. It's just Lily. Is the Void Tower somehow devoted to Grey, and that's why Lily is not invited? I really don't know, but I feel like I'm missing something important. The penultimate flashback cutscene takes place a year or two later, 
after military service. Lily's friend Sonia is apparently training to be a hairdresser, and Lily lets Sonia cut her hair short in an act of friendship, fashion, and mild rebellion. Gray does not react well to this unexpected change, and Lily provokes Gray further in a scene where I think I shall air my footage with my original commentary and reaction to this powerful moment. Don't you know what they say about short-haired women? Um, welcome to the 21st century, Granny. Why don't you get your hair cut as well? Who knows, maybe that way you could get some action between those uptight legs of yours and loosen up a bit. Oh my. <laughs> wow. Gray did not appreciate that. I won't listen to such talk from anyone in this house. How did you turn out such a haughty woman? You're worse than your mother. <gasps> I thought Lily didn't know. And apparently I thought correctly for once. Okay. Um, that was a very ugly way for it to come out. And it's kind of like the most disappointed in Grey I've been. Uh, in a number of respects, but this is a secret that kind of needed to be told at some point. Mom? Get out. I can't stand to look at you like that. Wow! And so we're not quite there yet, but in a bit we'll be discussing a number of historical texts, and I want to bring a little bit of that forward now just to make a wild speculation here. Some viewers may be familiar with the story of Samson and Delilah, a uh, noteworthy bit being that Samson was so powerful that he could fight a lion with his bare hands, and his power stemmed from his long, uncut hair. We've seen Grey transform into Grey the Destroyer, and we witness her throwing her cape and letting loose her long flowing hair. And I think possibly Grey, who's been grooming Lily to become a powerful fighter, maybe thinks that long hair acts as a charm of power or protection. And part of her overreaction in the scene, which leads to her accidentally spilling her secret, comes from the fact that she thinks Lily has just undone years of work cultivating that charm. But I kind of think it for reasons other than the Samson story. It's a big speculation, and we'll return to it again later. In the final flashback that modern Lily experiences during her dive at the Void Tower, we see Lily, perhaps checked into a hotel room, answering an unexpected phone call from Freya. We, the audience, are only privy to Lily's side of the conversation, but the inference we can draw, based on a scene we'll see in a moment, is that Freya has tracked down Lily to let her know that Grey is dead. Chronologically, what happens next is the conversation between Freya and Lily that I read alongside the jigsaw puzzles back at the very start of Act 2, where Lily heard, for certain, that Grey is not her mother, though she'd already long suspected it. We already reviewed that conversation because the flashback photos and topic of discussion were Grey's arrival in the modern world with baby Lily which happened some 20 years ago now in the timeline. The next scene, chronologically, is the opening gameplay of Act 2. When the player first encounters this scene, they have almost zero context with which to make any sense of what's going on, but now we can understand the events that unfold on the screen. Lily arrives back at the house. The house is dusty and stale, from which we can infer at least some number of days or weeks have passed since the argument between Grey and Lily. She goes up to Gray's room and shuffles through some old files and documents, looking for her birth certificate, which she finds to reconfirm what she already knows. The bathroom is in disarray. There are drugs and pills strewn about. She witnesses a ghost go into her room. Eagle-eyed viewers who caught multiple prior appearances of Void Lord Sif will probably recognize that figure meddling once again. She goes into her room and finds an envelope on her desk, addressed to her. She goes to open it, but a square hole opens in the floor. She comes over to take a closer look, peering at it from solid ground. 
Void Lord Sif manifests themselves in their full horrific glory, pushes Lily into the hole, and then disappears. Lily hovers over the hole in coyote time for a dramatic moment before falling in. And as per usual, we'll discuss the appearance of Sif near the end of the video. And this begins the second act of gameplay as Lily descends the basements of the Void Tower, as did Grey. Along the way, Lily experiences all the flashbacks that we've just covered over the past few minutes. And in the tower, Lily also has some similar NPC encounters as Grey, but also has three experiences that are notably different from Grey's and worth calling out. The first is Tail. When Lily meets Tail, the scene and discussion are different than that with Grey. The latter half of the conversation is noteworthy. Have you heard of the Void Ones as well, little one? Are you talking about the demons? Yeah, I think that's what my... She used to call them. A long time ago, I was part of one of the lords. While all the lords are able to change their appearance as they wish, my lord, Use, was unique. They say everyone saw them differently, and that their form would reflect the viewer's one true love. What purpose this trait served, I can't tell. But it seems I might have inherited it considering that you can see my true form. I guess you haven't met anyone you'd like to copulate with? What's up with the crass tongue all of a sudden? Love isn't about copulating. Besides, the last few years have just been a bit rocky, okay? Sorry, my understanding of mortals and their manners is rather limited. Why am I talking about this with you in the first place? Why am I in here anyway? Isn't this just a bad dream? From your point of view, that might as well be true. Don't let your guard down, however. Those without strong devotion are bound to lose their way within this labyrinth until nothing remains of them. Whatever it is that you're looking for, I hope you find it eventually. Thanks, I guess? Take care, little one. Tail calls this place a labyrinth, and I notice that the Void Stranger logo appears to be a labyrinth in the garden maze sense, that is a single winding path that just winds around itself in order to fill the space. We'll discuss that some more later too. In any case, the reveal that Tail appears to people as their true love has implications for our understanding of the story, as Grey witnessed Tail thusly, a blonde-haired woman with large breasts. But for now, We'll just move on to the next noteworthy NPC encounter, which is on Basement 167. While both Grey and Lily could interact with these reflection monsters on a number of different basements, to read one sentence of throwaway dialogue, this is the only basement floor where you're required to interact with them to continue, and there's a lot more dialogue. Lily's past reflection is mean and discouraging to her, saying things like, give up already, and you're pathetic, and you'll never make it. Contrast this with Gray's experience in the same Basement 4 puzzle, where Gray's past reflection acknowledges the difficulties, but says, you can't give up, you won't give up, because someone is waiting for you. I imagine these are windows into the characters' inner selves, showing off traits of the characters. Gray is driven, patient, and encouraging, whereas Lily, perhaps as the result of growing up under a demanding mother whose standard she could never live up to, is discouraging and self-critical. And one may also note that Gray's reflection portrait appears on the right, whereas Lily's reflection portrait appears on the left, though I'm not sure that that's actually meaningful. The final basement experience that differentiates Lily's dive from Gray's occurs on basement 226, where Lily encounters a strange old man. Let's watch my original footage. <gasps> Who is this? Why is this old geezer staring daggers at me? Yet another trick? You fiends. Does your malevolence know no bounds? I'm sorry? Is there a problem here? Be gone, demon. Maybe I should leave him alone. I can build. I could probably push him off. But I demand answers. Hmm, I may have mistaken you for someone else. What's a young girl doing in a place like this? 
And what happened to your hair? Some kind of accident, perhaps? My hair is doing just fine, thank you. And don't you girl at me. Is that how you're supposed to talk to ladies? Or did you escape from a nursing home, old man? What a shameless woman. Do you have any idea who you're talking to? I do not! Please inform me! You could be the emperor of what do you call it for all I care. That doesn't mean I'm gonna just gel with that. Holier than thou attitude, okay. <laughs> of yours. She's like ready to defend herself. Ha ha ha! Did he lose it completely? So this is what the world has turned into. Maybe I did have it all wrong from the beginning. Never mind me, young lady. I'd advise you to continue your journey. There's very little this old man can do to help you. I don't know who this man is, but my speculation is that it might be Lily's grandfather, Princess Lily's father, the king, who we never witnessed on screen back in Act 1. The reasons I think that this might be his identity are... At first, he mistakes Lily for someone else. This man presumably would have encountered Tail back on Basement 30 and seen his true love, so I imagine he, for a moment, thought that he saw his daughter, Princess Lily, grown up. But also, and this is the big one, he criticizes her hair. Nothing is truer to the human experience than parents and grandparents criticizing the hairstyles of their offspring. That said, I'm not sure if this speculative identification of this old man jives with some of my later analysis. And as an aside, back when Grey was on Basement 226, it was simply empty. There were no NPCs, nor a Void Lord statue on this floor. Lily continues down to Basement 254, where she has the memory of getting the phone call from Freya, and then solves the jigsaw puzzles that we already discussed at the very start of Act 2. The conversation ends with Freya saying, She loved you more than anything. And there's a hard cut to a blank screen with one word, Loved? and Sprite Lily falling to the floor. I've had enough. Just end it all. Lily falls over and turns into a rock egg thingy. Now Void Lord B appears, delighted that Lily has turned into a morsel for her to consume. But to B's amazement, the Lily rock pulses and glows, and then the Void Rod explodes out of it, disappears, and a new, huge Void Lord figure appears. Is this Ad, former ruler of the Void Lords, returning? Or are we witnessing the birth of a new Void Lord? I'm not sure. The figure knocks B away, takes the Lily Rock, and communicates, You do not belong here, little one. Lily's eyes open wide, and she's floating in outer space. Her entire dive through the tower basements, she had looked tired and haggard, but now her eyes are wide with amazement and wonder. The music starts going places. This scene reminds me of scenes from a few different movies where a character's story arc leads to a crescendo where they have a brief experience of the world that is so much more profound than their entire life up until that moment in time that that brief glimpse into a larger world more than compensates for the arduous journey that it took to get them there. I won't speculate about the meaning of Lily's vision in this video, so let's move on. Lily awakens at the sight of her grandmother's, the Queen's, grave, where Grey stands, looking as she appeared in her tower dive during Act 1. Lily engages in a one-sided conversation with the motionless, non-emotive Grey. The Queen's grave is also, noteworthily, intact. Lily's talk finally builds to the question, why didn't you tell me anything? Gray suddenly embraces her, and we see quick flashbacks of their lives in an emotional moment. Lily says, I'm still mad at you. I just wish you were here to hear that. Goodbye, Mom. Then Lily appears back in her room, perhaps back the very moment she entered the Void Tower. The envelope still sits on the desk, and interacting with the envelope shows... Inside the envelope is a small pendant, along with a handwritten letter. Should you read it? Then the game immediately cuts back to the Justice Hall. This time, Void Lord B is absent. 
Judge Zero tells Lily that Dis cannot detect a strong devotion in you. That's perhaps because I didn't have HP when I reached the end of the game in my playthrough? Nevertheless, Zero says, Dis will make a contract if Lily leaves in peace. So what does she desire? Lily is briefly overwhelmed, contemplating that basically gods are offering her anything she wants. She's wearing the pendant she just fished out of the envelope in her room a moment ago, by the way. Lily decides to say this. If I could wish for one thing, I want my mother to know that no matter the reason she chose me, I'm grateful for everything. Please, let her have peace. The way I, Brian, see it, this is the ultimate forgiveness. And she calls Gray her mother, by the way. I don't know how Lily could have become aware of the existence of the choice, the fact that Grey had to choose between Princess Lily or Modern Lily's life to save, but let's assume Modern Lily does know about the choice. I mentioned I had a theory why Grey chose the baby. Remember this old scene, but you'll need to become strong for your mother's sake. She's still waiting. I can't let her down again. The way I see it, Gray was given this impossible choice, but imagined for herself a winning scenario. Not wanting to kill Princess Lily or her unborn child, Gray comes up with a possible way to save both of them. She takes the child and leaves Princess Lily held in stasis. Part of Gray's contract is that she, Gray, can never return. But perhaps she can raise a child to grow into someone strong, Someone with the same knowledge and stamina and fight that Grey has, and that child might eventually be able to grow up and save the princess. I think Grey saved the baby, modern Lily, with the intention of raising her to eventually save Princess Lily, which explains the rigorous discipline Grey raised the child with, as well as the inability to explain the circumstances of her adoption as to do so would be tantamount to telling your child that you're using them as a pawn in your scheme, sending them to a deadly place to rescue someone they never even met, though admittedly her real mother, to satisfy Gray's own... Ambition feels like an apt word to describe Gray's desire for Princess Lily's safety. Gray saved the child's life by subjecting them to a life whose path was laid out in a straight line, one of duty one without choice, the exact same life that Princess Lily hated and rebelled against years ago. And modern Lily rebelled against it too. But for Grey, in the moment of the choice, the end justified the means, and this was a means to save two souls rather than just one. Which is why, to me, the lines, I want my mother to know that no matter the reason she chose me, I'm grateful for everything is such a perfect forgiveness to all the guilt Gray must feel. No matter the reason, I'm grateful. Anyway, Judge Zero hears this and starts laughing. And then... We're getting into wild speculation here, but this screen crack also happened at the moment that Lily and the Void Lords disappeared from the scene with Johan and Grey back in Act 1. And that happened at the moment that the eclipse started to end. And Grey was returned to modern Earth on the morning of a solar eclipse, making me think something like, maybe the Void Lords can only interact with the world in the absence of sufficient starlight, almost like vampires or something. In any case, modern Lily the girl who grew up wearing a Halloween costume with a shiny star on it, who saw that little girl reflected in the monsters of the Void Tower, the woman who after 254 basements turned into a rock that glowed and then exploded in light, has made a wish so pure, so dazzlingly bright, that she shines like the brightest star in the sky and breaks the whole existence of the Zero Justice Court and the helmet of its judge. Or probably not, I don't know, but it sounds kind of good, right? <laughs> In any case, perhaps an unintended side effect, or maybe it was intended, maybe Lily knows more than I realize, of her wish for Grey to be at peace means the burden that Grey has been carrying for literally the entire story thus far must be lifted. Grey's burden was a debt to a mother, 
or actually two mothers, to keep their child safe. And so the scene continues. Well said, stranger. And then we see modern Lily rescuing Princess Lily from her stasis. Now a conversation appears on the screen. So, what do you think? To be perfectly honest, your highness, I find it a bit too sophisticated for my taste. Never to mince any words, as per usual. Long time ago, people gave that name to the brightest star of the sky. I wish that one day she'll shine just as bright. Until then, please take care of her. I, Brian, don't know exactly how this happened, but I think this is a flashback of a conversation between Grey and a Princess Lily who knows she's pregnant and has named the baby. So let's go back in time. Just before Princess Lily disappeared with the Void Lords at the end of Act 1, at the moment the eclipse was ending and the stained glass window exploded, Princess Lily says, There's something I need to tell you, while looking back towards Grey. I think that off-screen, after the final justice scene with Grey being given the choice, but before Grey was returned to the modern world, Grey had the opportunity to speak to Princess Lily one last time. Had Grey already made the choice, or was she still contemplating it? Did Lily already know that she was pregnant, or did Grey inform her? We can only speculate. But in any case, we hear the end of the conversation, a conversation where Lily names her baby and entrusts Grey with their care. And for the second time in one life, Grey takes on the burden of caring for another mother's child. Grey now feels responsible for two lives, Princess Lily, locked in stasis in the void, and the new baby. Princess Lily named her baby Lilith. Lily, L-I-L-L-I-E, is Grey's unsophisticated nickname for Lilith, the name of the child who would one day shine as the brightest star in the sky. Pregnant Lily had a flower embroidered on the midriff of her wedding dress. Child Lilith wore a shining star pendant on her favorite Halloween costume. In the beginning, when sky and earth were still one and the same, a flower bloomed, lighting up the space with stars. Analysis In the final section of this video, I'll analyze the source material that Void Stranger has clearly drawn from in order to better understand some final details of the story. The key works to consider are 1. Dante's Inferno, the principal work from which the Void Tower derives, with each of its puzzle sections corresponding to one of the nine circles of hell. 2. The story of King Minos and the labyrinth that housed the Minotaur that devoured human sacrifices. And 3. Some Norse mythology. Understanding these works helps us interpret the stories I've recounted in this video and also will aid me in finally explaining the appearances of Void Lord Sif, which I've been putting off for too long. So let's recount the final scenes I have witnessed thus far in the game, which feature Lily, Lilith, Sif, and Zero. Princess Lily and Lilith, modern Lily, return to Lilith's home, and Lilith shares the letter that she found in the envelope. It was written by Grey in an ancient language that Lilith cannot read, but apparently Lily can, and she says the letter is for both of them. The scene cuts to the Void, where Void Lord Sif is watching them read the letter. Judge Zero appears, saying, You know you shouldn't pry on someone else's letter like that. Still keeping an eye on them? Void Lord Sif deflects, but Zero continues, Your lousy disguise may have fooled Dis, but I know you've been watching over them for a long time now. Or did that child just end up here by sheer accident? only to finally meet their mother? Sif says, That's what Ad would have wanted. I owed it to them. Besides, I only gave them a small push. Zero. Sure. Don't worry. Your secret is safe with me. We then learn from Zero that Dis is some kind of advanced computer research station that suffered some cataclysm many years ago, but may still be trying to fulfill its purpose. Zero, who has, by the way, no horns, has apparently finished their research and departs. Another brief credits roll is cut off by a final scene with Sif. Sif suddenly recalls that B needs rescuing, 
discards a disguise that reveals Sith's long hair, third and fourth horns, and unneeded glasses. And the Void Stranger title screen appears for the third time, starting the third act of gameplay. We haven't covered Dante's Inferno yet, but my subsequent analysis reveals that each of the Void Lords presided over a different circle of hell, each of which corresponds to a specific sin. Sif's sin is fraud. Sif plays the role of imposter, using deception and disguises to affect the events of the story. This final scene depicts Sif's north-facing sprite, which the eagle-eyed viewer may have spotted at least twice back in Act 1, during the wedding announcement and the dance practice scenes. Sif has indeed been watching over them for a long time now. When I heard Sif speak the words, that's what Ad would have wanted. I thought it rang a bell, and it was a line that I'd heard before, but not exactly. Back when, in Act 1, Four Eyes rescues Grey, that line was spoken, but with Ad replaced by Her Majesty. In the very final scene, we learn Sif uses disguises that involve changes of hair and glasses. And hair and glasses describes the Four Eyes sprite very well. Extending the parallel, this also carries the implication that Princess Azuli's mother, Her Majesty, the Queen, is actually Void Lord Ad, but we'll return to that shortly. Sif's final bit of meddling comes from the retrospectively hilarious line. Besides, I only gave them a small push. Here's the instant replay of the small push that occurs near the start of Act 2. The four horns help identify Sif though they were already spotted by eagle-eyed viewers in sprite form entering the room a few moments prior. Sif's motivation for influencing these earthly actions to help Lily's story reach its satisfying conclusion are unknown to me, though I hope that I'll learn about it in Act 3, where I get to replay the game as Sif. Dante's Inferno Inferno is the first part of Italian poet Dante's epic poem, The Divine Comedy, which describes a journey through hell, where hell is depicted as nine concentric circles deep in the earth. I knew almost nothing of Dante's Inferno a few weeks ago, but the strange creature who said, Papi de Selepe, caused me to do some googling and stumble into another rabbit hole of non-obvious story and structure that can be discovered by the discerning viewer of the first two acts. Let's start with the obvious parallels between Void Stranger and Dante's Inferno. The opening words of the Void Court of Justice are a direct translation from Dante's Inferno, Canto 4, line 40. It refers to the souls that reside in the first circle of hell, called the Limbo. Souls who lived sinless lives, but were not baptized in Christ and therefore could not get into heaven, but were instead trapped in limbo for all eternity with their only punishment being their desire, but inability, to go to heaven. In Void Stranger, the Void Tower structure is a linear parallel of Dante's Hell. The tower is divided into nine sections, like Hell's nine circles. Every 28 screens begins a new circle of Hell, and each circle starts with a floor devoted to a mural. The next floor has a statue of a Void Lord, then 25 puzzle floors, one of which has an NPC, and finally ends with a birch tree resting area where we witness the flashback cutscenes. In Dante's Inferno, each circle of hell corresponds to a particular sin, and that is where the committers of those sins had their eternal punishment. The sins translate to Void Stranger mostly directly. Each section of the Void Tower has a particular sin, a particular Void Lord, an NPC who committed that sin, and a mural whose translations I'll discuss. The murals can be translated into English text, and I've done so off-camera since the previous episode. Each square of the mural has fine detail that I'd previously overlooked. The alphabet we saw in the final basements of the Void Tower has the information to decode each letter as a 3x3 grid of dots. Here's the fine detail of the letter O from a mural, and how its white dots correspond to the code for the letter O. In the story of Dante's Inferno, the souls that enter Hell are judged by King Minos, who perceives the sins they've committed 
and then sentences them to a particular one of the nine circles of hell. Minos would signify which circle they were destined to go to by wrapping his snake-like tail around his body n times to signify the nth circle. In Void Stranger, that same role seems to have originally been played by Use, who we learned about from Tail's original conversation with Grey. I won't read all of Tail's story aloud right now, but the first part clearly describes the same role of Minos as the judge, and the second part describes how Use's own sin fractured the Void Lords into warring factions, which perhaps explains why some of the Void Lord statues have been destroyed and many of the Void Lords seem to be missing from the story. In Dante's Inferno, the name Dis could refer both to a walled city that housed the lower circles of hell, as well as to Satan himself, who resided at the very deepest point, for having committed the gravest sin, a personal treachery against God. In Void Stranger, Dis also resides at the deepest point of the Void Tower, on Basement 255. So why Dante's Inferno? It might simply be the game developers adapting an existing classic story framework. If you want to make a West Side story, maybe you start with Romeo and Juliet. But there's also the sci-fi trope of intelligent computer gone wrong that I've seen in places like Star Trek and Hitchhiker's Guide, which is also a plausible explanation. This might be a computer system from thousands of years in the future that had its memory banks mostly destroyed and its AI somehow latched on to an intact databank that contained Dante's Inferno, and made that the reason for its own existence, manifested that story into its simulation, or something. <laughs> and then there's the labyrinth, a word spoken by Tail to Lily to describe the Void Tower, a winding path that's pictured in the game's logo. The original labyrinth of myth was constructed by Daedalus, a skilled inventor, by the order of none other than King Minos, who in life was the king of Crete. It was built to house the Minotaur, a half-man, half-bull beast that fed on human flesh and that had been birthed by Minos's wife, the queen. Minos enclosed the Minotaur in this labyrinth and then demanded periodic live human sacrifices as tribute from nearby Athens, a recently conquered city, to be sent into the labyrinth to feed the Minotaur. And there's just a ton of obvious parallels there to the earthly events that we saw during Act 1. And in my research on King Minos, I also found another story where he attacked King Nysos' kingdom in another war. Nysos was said to have a lock of purple hair that kept him safe from harm until it was finally cut by his daughter. I'd mentioned the Samson Delilah story back in Act 2 regarding Lily cutting her hair, but there's multiple myths about hair providing a magical charm of protection, and this one is more closely related to the recurring figure of Minos that we see in Void Stranger. Let's move on now to Norse mythology. Freya was a Norse goddess, associated with motherhood, love, sex, but also war. In Norse mythology, half of those who die in battle go with Odin to Valhalla, but the other half of those honorable deaths are taken by Freya to Folkvagner. Also, in Norse mythology, the birch tree was sacred to Freya, and in many cultures, the birch tree symbolizes renewal or rebirth. And we'll come back to Odin in just a moment. I never finished the idea that Lily's mother, Her Majesty the Queen, was Void Lord Ad. This is suggested by the parallel lines we see spoken by Sif. But I'd also previously imagined to myself that Tail, as she appeared to Grey, depicted the Queen, since Grey was totally devoted to the Queen. The most noteworthy physical aspect here of Tail is large breasts, and if we take a look at the statue in front of the chest containing Ad's scepter, Lord Ad is depicted with large breasts. And furthermore, the statue wears a pendant, a pendant that sure looks a lot like the pendant that Grey wore in Act 1, before gifting it to Princess Lily as an important wedding gift. I think Queen Ad originally gave this pendant to Grey. 
Ad's statue also seems to maybe wear a weird headpiece. In addition to Ad's own Void Lord horns, it looks almost like she's wearing some kind of animal skin that also has horns as well. Perhaps like some kind of Viking headdress? Could Ad possibly also be akin to Goddess Freya? And if so, could the new Void Lord that appears at the end of the story be somehow akin to Odin? It does have one eye, just like Odin did, and it does seem to be the supreme, all-powerful ruler of the realm. I don't know. If Princess Lily's mother was indeed a Void Lord, then that maybe explains how she could transform into a monster with 9999 hit points and beat up the royal guards as a little child. But we lack the same understanding for Grey. What is her backstory, and why the mysterious missing womb? There's still numerous other loose ends of story and gameplay that I've yet to fully pin down, but that's going to be work for future Brian to think about. This ends my analysis. This was exhausting, so thanks to anyone who's still here at the end. For my subscribers who've been watching the whole way, next time we'll continue playing the game as Sif. And for anyone else watching, if you want to see how I got to this point, there's already a playlist of 53 videos of Brian Plays Void Stranger, so feel free to check it out at your leisure. But with that, I am Dr. Brian Lorgon 111 and I hope as always, you all are having a great day, and I'll see you again soon for more Void Stranger.